Welcome back to Soulback. This is the R&B Podcast. Kyle here, and I'm back with Ed and Tom. What is going on, guys? What's up, players? It's been a minute since all three members of the NWO were in the house at one time, so that's what's up. It's it, We missed you last week, Ed, with Teo from Drew Hill, man. It was a good one. Love that guy. Yeah, man. That is a good guy. I'm really glad and excited that we could get him on. He doesn't get enough credit, so shout out to my dog. Yeah, and a lot has happened since we were all, all three of us were on this podcast. I went to Asia. I came back from Asia. Guys, we got to all go to Japan one day. I don't think we even talked about my Japan experience on the podcast yet. Oh. But let me just say, guys, they love R&B. And I, I lived it. I was in it. And I can say that 100%. Wow. Now, the R&B that they love, do they love R&B that came out in 2019? Or are they, like, still living in 2015? Oh, no. They love they love the good R&B. I, I was at a, uh, a mall, and they were playing the SWV record uh, Someone with Diddy. I haven't heard that yeah. song in years, and it was playing in Japan. Uh, I don't think SWV would say that was one of their better songs, though. <laughs> so... Regardless, if you said um, if you said that, if you said they were playing Human Nature, I might get excited. No, well, '90s R&B is '90s R&B, Tom. Um, and then at <laughs> exactly. another, at, at a restaurant, they were playing one of Seven Streeter's EPs. Like, who does that? Who plays a whole EP by Seven Streeter? And not, and, and I love Seven Streeter's music, but really, I mean, you don't get wow. that. In, yeah, you don't get that in in the U.S. or Canada. I don't know if you get that anywhere in the world, and we love Seven Streeter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man. Um, but like I said, a lot has transpired uh, since we were all on this. Um, Ed, I'm sure you've seen the new Sonic trailer. Tom and I talked about it last week, but uh, Sonic is looking uh, really good in this new movie, eh? Um, looking really good. It's like somebody has a Target costume on. I'm like, why is his legs baggy? What is going on with Sonic? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a oh, rumor boy. that they're going to, due to the outcry, they're going to retouch the whole thing. But why we're having a Sonic movie in 2019 with Jim Carrey. I'm like, are we sure this wasn't locked in a vault from 1997 or something? It seems a little out of place. Wow. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, Ed, we missed you last week, but we were raving about this Fantasia record that just came out. Do you want to touch on that? I know you posted about it on your on your blog as well. Yes, and I've totally forgot until you brought it up. I am a fan of this one. Now, as many readers know, um, I am a fan of Fantasia. I am not often a fan of Fantasia when she goes on her Easter Sunday riffs and goes ballistic and screaming and snotting on the stage. I know y'all love it. But the screaming can be dialed back a few notches. However, in this new song, we get pure vocals. It's a true and true R&B song. It is pretty much everything I would want from a Fantasia record in 2019. So I'm looking forward to her new project and probably one of my favorite R&B songs of the year so far. Absolutely. Now, Tom, now, Tom, you posted a thing on our Instagram. You've been doing it quite often over the last two weeks but you've listed out four artists and you ask who should open up the show who should close the show and it's an interesting oh, one because man you you th and this one i thought was interesting so we have jasmine sullivan fantasia sierra and keisha cole and out of those four i would say i mean it's, it's between jasmine and fantasia as far as having the least amount of hits um when it comes to like mainstream but everyone picked Fantasia to close the show so I guess concerts aren't just about the hits right ah uh, man I mean I'll just chime in real quick I feel like our readers are probably the small majority of who knows what's going on with R&B but if you ask the people off the street they'd probably say Sierra I mean just based off the hits and thinking she's a celebrity I don't think it's the right pick Ed what do you think Absolutely not, please. I mean, Sierra's <laughs> going to get... Listen, it's being real, dog. The Sierra gets the, the shine right now because who she's married to. And I'm not saying that as... And I'm not comparing that she's lesser than. But she's in the headlines right now because of her husband, because of her beef with that garbage rapper, um, baby daddy of hers. 
So, of course, because she has the quote-unquote highest celebrity due to social media buzz, she's going to be seen as the superior artist. Of them four names that you named, absolutely not. I do think that if I was closing that show, it would probably be Fantasia. But, like I said, guys, Fantasia doesn't necessarily have a lot of hit records, a lot of records that people may remember actually now that i remember it they played uh when i see you in japan as well i thought that was pretty cool but what do you think fantasia's legacy will be you know in the future since we're talking legacies and we're going to talk legacy some more right after this but fantasia i mean a vocal beast american idol winner but do we what, what's it going to look like in 20 30 years from now Hmm, now, well it's time for your boy to keep it real, as he always does. If you have beef, E.T. Bowser on Twitter is where you go drop off your beef, so I can flambe it. Um, Fantasia, absolutely phenomenal vocalist. When it comes to albums, to be honest, they're kind of hit and miss. I think that she will be revered as a phenomenal performer with great songs, but there to me always feels like And she still has time for this, so don't take this as, oh, I'm writing her off. Because a lot of times we judge people in the moment and forget that they have years ahead of them. And Fantasia still has years ahead of her. I feel like her career should be a little higher than where it is. And I know she's had some stops and starts due to some personal things and some albums that didn't quite hit or some songs that didn't quite hit. She's very good. But I don't think that she is on the level of greatness that you would expect. So if we were judging her legacy right now, I think that of the 2000s, 2010 era artists, she was one of the standouts, not the standout. But I think there's time for her to gain some more ground there. Fair enough. And we'll talk more legacy later, some negative. But before we get into that, Tom, it's time for your weekly fan shout out, listener shout out. Who do we have this week? We got two I want to shout out. And let me just say, we have a street team now, guys. A street team? A street team, (laughs) yeah. Well, specifically, these are some of our readers who have been tipping me off to some new music that's coming out. Because like I said, guys, you don't know what's going on. There's no more press releases. Artists just post something on Instagram. A new music that came, new song that came out. And it's like, you know, Instagram now, they throttle you. So all your followers won't even see you know, all your posts, you know, they want to make you pay for people to see that. So you could easily miss something that came out. Now I got a couple people tipping me off to stuff that's coming out. We really, really appreciate that. Want to give a quick shout to KW8971 on Instagram, man. He pretty much is all over everything. He's tagging me in posts about stuff that's coming out. We really appreciate that. And Brown D251992. She, this person has been DMing us new music that's coming out, letting us know what's going on. That stuff is invaluable these days. And to have people that ride with you like that is, is a cool thing. So we really appreciate that. We just want to help spread the word. And they're helping make that happen. Man, shout outs to them. Now, back to this legacy, legendary talk. Um, Tom posed the question, Ed, to the people and asked if your cousin Chris Brown would go down as a legend and tom and i talked about this last week in terms of i think it's a generational thing some of the <clears throat> older folks such as you hold guys. on hold hold on why is this coming <laughs> up on two straight episodes no no i just wanted to bring this up and ask ed here oh because one of the questions that did uh, th- that did come up was what chris brown records are considered r&b classics um i know one of our readers said kiss kiss with t-pain uh, which huh. we unanimously shut down. But, huh. Ed, I'm going to throw it to you. What are the classic Chris Brown records? Oh, my gosh. Play, you put me on the spot. As we all know and have discussed here many, many times, I am very selective about what we call a classic because I can't stand it. I don't know what it was. It's something about maybe 2010 where we decided... We're just going to name everything classic, and everybody's going to be a legend. And if anybody's had a career longer than six years, you're a legend and you're an icon. No. That is a select label for select artists and select songs. I don't throw that term around a lot. When it comes to 
legendary or classic Chris Brown songs, songs to me that will transcend generations. I'm not talking about a song that you liked when you were in high school. That's not a classic. That's an old song you liked when you didn't know no better. A classic is a song that will go on to stand the test of time. The little kids dancing to If It Isn't Love, the new edition routine, that is a classic because it has transcended generations, 20, 30 years. Michael Jackson got a whole bunch of them. Janet has a few. There are many classic songs. And when I think of my cousin Chris's discography, songs that will last beyond the era, I'm not just talking about songs that were hot in the T-Pain era. That's an era. That's not a classic. A song that will kind of extend beyond that, maybe Yo, but that's really the only thing that pops to mind. What did Hold on, think? Ed. Hold on, Ed. You sound like an old hater right now. So what you're telling me is there's been no classic songs in the past 10 years in R&B music? Did I say there were no songs? I'm talking about Cousin Chris. Name one of his songs. First of all, that man has been out for 15 years and has two decent <clears> albums. <throat> How are you a legend and your discography is full of garbage? Other than the first I mean, two, who's rocking a Chris Brown album? I mean, I don't look at me, man. I gave up on him after Deuces <laughs> came out, and I heard Hose Ain't Loyal, and I was like, okay, goodbye. Well, I'm wow. sure some folks will call that classic, too. But again, are you <laughs> going to be listening to that at the old folks' home? Well, actually, I will. Well, oh, let's scale this back here. Um, I think <laughs> yes, Yo will be a cl- Yo will be a classic. Um, I, I think with you, with you will probably go down as a classic as well. Um, let's let's just keep it real though. If Yo came out in the '90s, it wouldn't even have been a single. I mean, just being honest. No, I mean that's true, but you can't judge that by that. There are yeah. lots of songs that came out in the I'm '90s. Saying, if it came out in the '60s, them <clears throat> things would be on the left one cutting room full. Well, well, then we have to say Deuces is is basically a timeless song based on uh, versus everything else at the time. If you're looking at it like That's, that, that was no be my because argument. no, it has <laughs> to be able to transcend the era. It can't just be a song that was hot in its era. If Deuces, I like Deuces a lot. It's one of my favorite songs from him. I don't see that transcending the era. I see that being hot for its era. That to me is what defines a classic song. Is Deuce is going to tear the club up in 2040, or is it just a song that we like now because we used to like it when we were younger? That's the difference. I think if we're going to go by that statement, I think Loyal will go down as a classic. I can see people rocking to that in 2040. I mean, you might be right. But the the other thing that we have to keep in mind in these convos is that we're talking about stuff that are classics that aren't even that old. Nobody was arguing about classic songs from Teddy P back in 1977. Like we let we let the songs marinate, become part of the culture, and then decide after the fact, okay, we saw the impact it's made. It's hard to have an impact on the song that's not even that old. Uh, speaking of Teddy P, I'm sure he'd be rolling in his rolling over in his grave if he heard these hoes ain't loyal. Come on. Calm down. <laughs> I'm sure he was. All right. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, now, one more point about Chris Brown. Ed, we went through the features on his album last week, which include Lil Wayne, Drake, Gunna, Tory Lanez, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I have some Good breaking job. news about this new Indigo album. Um, Chris Brown just turned 30 last week, and he announced this Indigo album, Ed, will have 30 songs. Are you ready? Hell- here we go again. We just, I barely survived. I have had 15 years shaved off of my life. Listen to that last album. What was that, 45 songs? Now we got yep. 30 more? A song for every year of his life that's disappointed us? So that, could, that proves he's going to have three good songs because he only gave us three good years. Can we move <laughs> on, please? I'm so tired of talking about Chris Brown. That's all your right, boy. All right. <laughs> Legend indeed. Um, all right, let's talk about some other things. Now, if you don't like artists that drop music every year, every six months, how about D'Angelo, who drops music like every six years? Um, Tom, Ed, he has a documentary coming out. Ed, I've been waiting to talk to you about this, man. D'Angelo. We got to fight over this one. Oh, gosh. What's up with D'Angelo? 
Well, first of all, yes, he's got a documentary coming out called Devil's Pie. Um, it released at the Tribeca Film Festival already, but I think it'll be available for everyone else soon. But man, we, we posted an interesting question to the readers, and it was pretty much how many classics albums does D'Angelo have? And mm-hmm. really, really, the discussion is around the album Devil's Pie. Now, a lot of the readers said, yes, it is a classic. I disagree. I know you think it is, but like my point is... Well, Ed, I want to hear you say why it's a classic. No one was really able to explain why it's a classic. Well, to be honest, no offense to our readers, because I'm not—I wasn't there. I didn't see the conversation. But as we just discussed with cousin Chris, people don't understand what makes a classic anyway. Classic has just become song I like. I like that song as a classic. I used to like yes. that song as a classic. That's yes. not what a classic is. The reason why, and we—I've gone on record before. I am not a fan of Voodoo. I do not like that album. And I, but as an unbiased reviewer, I can speak. And say that that album is a very well done, updated sound of the kind of 20 years prior funk sound. It is a a kind of a mesh of R&B and funk. And it kind of laid the groundwork. Not specifically, because we didn't see a whole bunch of voodoo copycats. But the sounds and elements and instrumentation, that kind of dark sound that that we saw on that album, would go on to lay the groundwork. For the neo soul movement, which was kind of getting in high gear then, but really took off after that album. So to me, going back to my definition of what makes a classic is an album that has lasting impact on a genre <clears throat> after its release. Not some y'all yelling about on Twitter for two minutes and then forget about like that Lil Wayne album or that Meek Mill album. This is something that continues to have ramifications long after it dropped. That's why, even though I don't listen to it hardly at all, that's only a couple songs I really tolerate on that album, I can recognize what it did for R&B, what it did for his legacy, and what it did to push the genre forward. So to me, it's a classic, but I ain't really rocking with it. I mean, I'll just say quickly, I don't think it's a classic. It doesn't have staying power. When do you ever hear Devil's Pie when do you ever hear left and right with Method Man and Red Man? Like, they don't play these songs. Now, well, don't get me wrong. That- Untitled is one of the most covered songs I've ever heard. Sure, it's a timeless. It made a huge impact at the time. But I wouldn't say this album has stood the test of time, Ed. Well, I think when you're looking at, because you're looking at the singles, and I agree that those first two singles didn't really even do much. But Untitled is the one that's gone on to infamy yes. for many different reasons. However, again, we have to look at the sound and what came of it. And one album that I compare it to on the hip-hop side is Kanye's Dark Twisted Fantasy album. I think that album is very overrated. And now I'm getting to that. You want to talk to me about that, hit me up on Twitter. Because a lot of that is hype. However, even though that album didn't generate a whole bunch of massive singles, what it did creatively, not only for the artist, not only for the genre, not only for that kind of the aura of D'Angelo himself and Kanye in this instance was help kind of define a new sound that a lot of people couldn't really touch. So it's one that as a body of work stands as a strong testament to the genre as opposed to something that gave us a whole bunch of singles that people caught. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now guys, we're going to have a guest come in now. I forgot to mention it earlier. Like I said, every week, We try to bring in someone special, someone who has brought soul back. And Tom, I'm really excited about this one. Who do we have today? I'm even more excited, Kyle. This is, I could easily say, one of the best male vocalists in R&B we've heard the past couple of decades. Man, we are so excited to have this guy back coming with a new album. He made us wait a little bit, but the new album's coming. We love the single Sent From Heaven. And man, welcome, Rashawn Patterson. Thank you so much. Absolutely, man. Um, Rashawn, before, yeah, go ahead, Kyle. Oh, I was gonna say, I mean, not to cut you off, but I, I'm so excited about the record sent from heaven. And Tom, I want you to chime in on this if possible, because Rashawn, let me tell you, when I first heard the record, all I thought about was, wow, feeling in R and B again, feeling in music. Tom, what was what was your reaction when you heard <laughs> this song? It's tough in R and B these days. We don't quite get that sound we we're lo- we love hearing. You know, that makes mm-hmm. you feel something, that brings mm-hmm. emotion. 
you know, you get that live instrumentation that, you know, it's, oh, man, we, we just love this song. It's easily one of the best we've heard this year. Tell us a bit about the single. Uh, the single was <clears throat> created in L.A. Um, musicians that have played with me over the course of the last 22 years. Um, we went to the studio. They laid down a few tracks. It was uh, the drummer, keyboardist, and guitarist slash bassist. And I co-produced it with the drummer and the bassist guitarist, whose name is Jairus Mosey. The drummer's name is D-Loc. Yeah. And came in the studio. They laid down a few different vibes. And I went back in the studio a few days later and sifted through the ideas and stuff that were laid. And on this particular day, I chose what inevitably has become sent from heaven. And I wrote the song and sang it and then had sent the basic stuff that I laid down to this cat in Chicago named Sam Trump, who is also a singer, but it, this collaboration with him, he laid and arranged the horns and placed the horn solo. So sent it to him and when he sent it back to me after I had given him a few notes of what I wanted him to do essentially he sent it back and it was perfect and it just completely made the song perfect in my opinion once once I heard the horns and the arrangement it was just so beautiful and very much a tribute to the music that I grew up listening to the artists and caliber of musician and songwriter and producer who have influenced what I've done over the years. So um, as far as the style of song, it was not intentional to, like, record, you know, a song that was traditional R&B type soul music. It just, mm -hmm. that was one of the tracks that they laid down, one of the vibes, and... I just wrote to it, but I'm happy to know that it resonates with people. For sure. Now, Ed, uh, before Rashawn got on this call on, on the podcast, you and I were talking about his music, and from my understanding, your wife your wife loves Rashawn Patterson. So talk about what goes on in the Bowser family household when the music <laughs> is on. Your wife must be blasting Rashawn Patterson a lot, right? <laughs> Why are you putting me on blast, Kyle? Um, yeah. <laughs> My, both my wife and I are huge fans going way back to 96 when Stop By Drop. Um, one mm -hmm. thing I think that really resonates with this current single that has resonated with the music um, from the past and that has really mm -hmm. defined Rasan's sound is the songwriting and the instrumentation. One of my favorite joints that um, he has done is Treat You Like a Queen back in, it had to be like 99 or so I was in college. 99. And I remember when... Yes, and when the lyrics start, I think you said something to the effect of, you know, you're wearing shades, blah, blah, blah. And when you first hear mm -hmm. it, you're thinking, okay, you're talking about this girl that's just, you know, she thinks she's stunning with a stun of shades on. But mm -hmm. then it becomes this commentary on domestic violence. Talk a little bit about how the songwriting that has kind of been your mantra has really come between that and the instrumentation that has really made mark over the years how you have continued to just build upon that year after year. It's it's a natural thing. It's never something I put a whole lot of thought into. It's just a part of my gift to be able to write and communicate through music and um, relate to people. My experiences are very similar to everyone else's, you know, in terms of being a human being, living life, and, you know, experiencing the hurts and pains of life. And I respond to those experiences the same way everyone else does. Um, my gift just affords me the ability to be able to articulate them in song. Um, but... I don't go into recording thinking, okay, let me write about this, let me write about that. 
I just naturally write what is prevalent in my spirit, you know. And in writing and creating music, there is, like, this portal <laughs> where where the gift comes from, where the melody comes from, where the ability to write and tell a story that will connect with the spirit, you know, that is a gift in itself. And when I'm creating and when I've created with friends of mine who are artists also, I've been able to witness that connection to that other universe that gives you the lyric, that gives you the melody, you know what I'm saying, that gives you that divine communication. And it's a beautiful thing to witness and possess. So, you know, you just kind of, you have to tap into that. And I'm blessed and fortunate to be able to be connected to spirit in such a way that I don't have to force it, which is also why it may take the years in between records because it's something that I don't force, and I wait until I have something to say and communicate that's strong enough for me to want to. And, of course, I wait until I'm inspired to, and then, you know, spirit kind of says, okay, it's time <laughs> to do this mm-hmm. again, you know? Yeah, and so, um, um, based on that, that really made me think of something that has really come to mind with some of our younger listeners, Rashawn. Uh, we see a lot of artists from, especially from the mid nineties, um, the D'Angelo's, the Badus, mm-hmm. the the Maxwells. A lot of artists will will see them drop an album maybe every five years or so, and mm-hmm. because we live in this era of social media and immediacy and you got to drop something every three months or you're irrelevant. Right, right. It's good to hear you talk about the importance of letting the music breathe, letting the craft breathe, yeah. taking that time off to kind of develop your thoughts. Is that something that you think that artists need to embrace more, or is it more of a – because, again, it's a different time, a different era. Should they go with the flow, or should they take time to just kind of, I'm going to step back, reevaluate, and then come strong later? I think it's important to absolutely go with the flow. You know, if your creative flow is at a pace where, you know, it's just popping out of you and it's good and it's meaningful, um, then then go with that flow. But I feel like there will come a point when you exhaust yourself and you may not necessarily have – uh, within that pace that you had been flowing at, there may not be that much depth or substance. You know, it may become redundant. And at that point, I feel it's important to be able to look at that and know that you can take a step back and breathe and live and let the music that you have made run its course um, because music, in, in my experience, I have, with the albums that I've made, from the first one to now, people are constantly discovering who I right. am and what I've done. So people in 2019 who are just discovering who I am can go back 22 years ago and hear music that, Still is credible that still fits into this time frame that we're in, and that music still speaks that music is still fresh that music is still able to resonate with people as if it just came out today and I feel like if I were pressured or took on the pressure over all this time to to feel like I had to always have something out every year or this and that, that it would to some extent diminish the value and validity of what it is 
that I want to, that I put out. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, the vocals could always be good. And because I know how to write a song, I can write a song about, you know, trees and water. But mm-hmm. do we need a song about trees and water? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> no, really. You know, it's like, you know, so I <clears throat> give myself that time. And I do think it's important for the performers of today who just constantly put product out. You know, it's like you can love Snickers and want to eat one every day and may actually eat one every day for two weeks straight. But at some point, (laughs) you're going to be sick of Snickers. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it's good candy, and it definitely satisfies, you know what I'm saying? And if you haven't eaten, a Snickers will absolutely let you float through for a few hours without a full meal. But eventually, it's not good for you. You know what I'm saying? And you get tired of it. So in this current climate, I get pretty bored because a lot of it is monotonous. And inevitably, it's just noise, you know, unless you're digging and finding artists that are feeding you, that are out there truly speaking from their experience and putting thought and intention into making art that is impactful because they are there. We are there, you know, but in terms of mainstream, like that shit is just, (laughs) you know, I can't even really put it into words, but it's just not for me. Right. We know exactly what you mean. And we even comment often on, on this show about how, some of our favorite artists from the 90s and 2002 release music every year or so. But they feel like they need to, and the quality yeah. just isn't there. So we wish more yeah. artists would take your approach. Wait till you feel it's time, not just do it because you feel like you have to. I think that that yeah. definitely works. And I think we're definitely yeah. going to hear that on your new album, Heroes and Gods, which is coming out. Man, what can you tell us about the album? The album is very much like my previous ones in that, it's broad in the scope of exploring different genres, you know what I'm saying? Like, over the course of my career, I have tapped into different vibes, you know. I've never been one to box myself into one genre, even if that genre was where people were introduced to me, where people mm-hmm. fell in love with what I do, where people wish I would have stayed, all that, like, I feel that, but I got to go where I need to go. So I feel people who have fully supported my craft and have been aware of every album that I have released and the journey, they are aware that it's going to be a mixed bag. (laughs) You know what I mean? So this album is in the same tradition of those previous records. Um, This album is as my others always rooted in love and the growth from experiences with love and relationship with people, the uh, desire that I have always had to be progressive, not only musically, but in my beliefs, and articulating through song what that transformative uh, growth has been for me and in terms of spirituality as well. Um, And really being able to express the importance of owning one's power, um, being able to identify the power in others, you know, and understanding that we are all a reflection of one another, particularly when we do reach certain levels of transcendence and growth, people come in our lives to mirror that, you know, and assist us to grow further. 
and that's what this album is about. Nice. Yeah, as you've been giving us so much through this conversation, I stumbled across, I mean, it's been years since I've heard it. I completely forgot about it, but I stumbled across Can't We Wait a Minute mm. from when you first released that record. And wow, that song is mm-hmm. so powerful. And mm-hmm. I've read comments where people are saying, like, I have to hear this at least three times a day. And it just yeah. reminds me of how powerful music is. And of course, we got to bring up the record that you did for Brandy Baby, which is a classic. Um, mm-hmm. in the genre of R&B, of just music in general, even because it crossed mm-hmm. over and it did so well. Um, just talk about the impact of that song for your career. Um, that song was very instrumental in me attaining my publishing deal back in the day, as well as my record deal. Oh. I had been uh, shopping for a record deal around the time that her song was released. Um, but once it came out and became successful, you know, it, it, it added to the value of of my name as an artist and songwriter. So I was 19 when Baby was released. And... Uh, it was very unexpected for me. I just, I didn't expect it to be as successful as it has been. And I just remember that it was a lot of fun at that time to be involved with her record, to watch her be such a great talent at such a young age and to have contributed to such a classic and influential album. Um, it took me years before I got the the magnitude of the importance of that record and the fact that I was involved in one of her biggest songs of her career. Because um, at the time, I was just, you know, walking around. I knew I had a song on her record, but, you know, I didn't make it that big of a deal. And um, so that, the success of that song helped me get my record deal, and it put more of a spotlight on me as a songwriter and um, still does to this day. It's funny because I was out last night eating with my friend Joy, and while we were in the spot, it was also it's also a bar, so there's a jukebox, and they were playing. They played Baby twice while we were, there. <laughs> and wow. it's just it's always interesting to be present when you're in an atmosphere where folks are just chilling and eating and vibing and drinking and enjoying a song that you contributed to, and they have no idea that you're kind of sitting right there next to them. <laughs> you know what I mean? And That's pretty cool. It is. And um, I do enjoy the anonymity of that, though. Like, I'm not someone who needs everybody in the room to know I wrote that. Like, I'm good just sitting right there and observing it and feeling it and taking it in and knowing, being able to honor myself at the same time and say, yo, you, you did that. You were part of that, you know, and allow that to... Uh, strengthen my view of myself and, and my esteem and and pat my shoulder. You know what I mean? Right. Pat myself on the back. So, yeah. That's pretty cool, man. I got to share a story with you, though, of when I first became a, a fan of yours and a believer in your music is when I heard the song Spend the Night. Now, mm. man, I just I still play that song multiple times, <laughs> you know, every every week probably. But, man, I was just searching that song on YouTube to hear a live performance. Now, I've seen you perform it live. I've checked you out here in New York at BB King's a couple times, man. It's always a great performance. But I found this performance where you performed it live at the Belasco. And oh, yeah. this is probably one of the best R&B performances I've seen. I'm talking, like, so much feeling. You know, eyes wow. closed when you're singing. That means it's coming from the soul. 
sweat pouring down, the crowd's into it, full <laughs> band behind you. You know, it's just one of, and you did like an extended version where you were kind of just freestyle singing at the end. Like, you don't really get that type of thing. And it, like, that type of feeling is what us R&B fans crave, man. So, and your music has always had feeling like that, you know? Thank you. Um, I guess just talk about what it's like to put on shows like that and, and be in that moment and be able to share that gift. Hmm. Uh, before I step on the stage, my intention is to always be able to connect with spirit and go to that place where I am a conduit, but also navigating the room consciously. So it's a fine line of being able to separate yourself from the room so that you can connect (laughs) to the heavens, but then also dictate the mood and the energy you know, and where it can go. Um, For me, as a singer, I have to detach myself from me so that I can go to that place because that place for me is, it's otherworldly and Mm -hmm. it's difficult to put into words But the best way to describe it is to say that everything that you feel from watching and listening, all that that does for your spirit, it's probably 60 times more than that for me. Wow. That's amazing. For the singer, for the artist, you know, that's transferring all of that information and energy. Um. Yeah, that's the best way I can describe it. But I, I've come to to appreciate and further understand at this point in time that that is what my supporters come for. They not only come to hear their favorite songs, but they come to feel that. Right. And there was a time in the beginning of my live shows where I was when I initially started touring and I was tapping into that and you know a song could last 12 minutes <laughs> oh wow <laughs> and it was probably too much you know what I'm saying and people were like okay I need for him to like stop and like go to the next <laughs> song but um, over time I learned to tap into that not stay there as long unless it was totally necessary and spirit was just demanding that. Um, right. But over time I have found the balance and people that come to have that experience come specifically to be lifted. Right. You know, spiritually, mentally, like, and to know that that is, also why it is necessary for me to be the artist that I am because it's affecting not only my own uh, further awareness of spirituality, it's assisting others to do that. It's, It's allowing people to go on that journey also and go to that galactic place that actually exists inside of all of us. Wow. Because really that's who we are. That's where we come from. So we get to reconnect with that in live shows. So if you're out there listening and you have not been to one of his shows yet, it's an experience. I've been through, I've been to a few of them. So please, you know, you know, come to one when he's in your city. Absolutely. Love your live show. Thank you for that. Thank you. So um, we're just about out of time. Is there anything you would like to add? I would just like to add uh, that I'm grateful and thankful to you all for having me today. And to, you know, I got soul because y'all have 
been riding with me for some time now and been very supportive. And I appreciate that love that y'all give me and the audience that y'all have who supports what I do also. So thank you for that. Absolutely, man. Always glad to support. Like I said, man, we're really excited you're coming back with this album this year. Can't wait to hear yes. it. You know, lo- love the single. And, uh, man, we'll, we'll be rocking with you and helping to spread the word so people know they need to hear this quality music, man. Thank you so much. And all right, Ed, that was our guest, man. Another great guest for us. Listen, it's always good to hear my boys come through dropping some knowledge, whether it's talking about live shows or we're talking about just the overarching impact of a career or Son Patterson, my man. Shout outs to Mr. Patterson. Now, Ed, can we get into the player, please? We can. You already got me riled up, so. But Rasan got me um, in a good mood, so we can go with it. <laughs> well, I was going to bring up Cousin Chris again, but I think you had uh, already annihilated him enough with your earlier rants. But uh, I'm just going to mention this, and you can tell me what you want to say. But Chris Brown was beefing with this uh, with this group, Churches, I think is the name. Because Churches took a stance and said, I don't understand why Marshmello is working with Chris Brown. He is a woman beater, etc., etc., in which Chris Brown replied back with a bunch of losers. These are the type of people I wish walk in front of a speeding bus full of mental patients. Why is he including the mental patients in this? First of all, I, I've, I forgot totally that this even happened, and I didn't realize it was beefing with churches. Why does he beef with churches of all people? That's... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, Cousin Chris, I'll be yelling at him at the family reunion. Anyway, this proves that my boy has issues. Why would you want someone to be hit by a bus? Vehicular homicide. Oh, and let's make mental patients too? How demented is this dude? Yeah. Uh, next player, please. Uh, apparently Taylor Swift copied Beyonce's Coachella performance. Oh, boy. Listen, my mentions have been on fire for probably like a week due to this thing. And the memes have been pretty funny. I will say this. There have been some people who've been like, I don't see what the big deal is. They just had a marching band. Seeing that Beyonce just had an entire documentary based around this marching band culture, HBCU culture. And here she comes out here with her own band. Man, you know, get your raisin potato salad stuff out of my face. If you're going to be, <laughs> the do your own thing. Why must you copy? And I know that people are saying, well, it was intentional. She's trying to get buzz. There's a difference between tributes and trolling. And I wish the world knew the difference. <laughs> Fair enough. And then the last play of please, and I think Tom just stepped out for a bit, but it doesn't matter because he doesn't even care. Uh, he doesn't watch movies or TV <laughs> shows. But uh, um, can we give a play of please to anybody that tried spoiling the uh, Marvel Avengers movie? Not only can we give a player, please, we can give them hands because I had it spoiled for me. I was not able to see it opening night like a lot of you weirdos. Some of us have to work and have other responsibilities. I couldn't see it until two. Well, no, I think I saw it Sunday. I saw it Sunday afternoon. So a few days after. And even by then, I had it spoiled by the Internet. And I stayed off the Internet I stayed off of social media. I disabled the text on my phone because I didn't want one of my friends to accidentally slip up. I stayed off of soul and stereo because I love my readers, but I didn't want them to accidentally slip up. And it was still spoiled. So to those who like to spoil, I can't wait until my J's meet your balls one day. Wow. <laughs> on a serious note, though, before we get out of here, um, when is it an appropriate time to talk about that movie in, pu- in public? Because I was at Dairy Queen yesterday with my friends, and we wanted to talk about it, but we had to caution ourselves because there were people around us, maybe in the restaurant, that hadn't he- hadn't watched the movie yet. Good for you for being respectful. Here's my thing about spoilers, real quick. When it comes to a T, te- if you're watching a live TV show, so I will use Game of Thrones for example, because that's been a conversation. If you are watching a TV show that's airing live and you are live tweeting about it, that's fine. It's airing live. If you don't have time to watch it, don't get on social media. You know folks are talking about it. If it's a book or a movie 
where that will take considerable amount of time for people to find the time to actually see it because people don't have time to sit and read a whole book in a day or people don't have time to go run into the movies right after work because they have responsibilities. Play it. At least give them a few weeks. Jeez. And a movie that's as spoiler heavy as Avengers, I would say at least a month before you yak about it on social media blindly. You want to talk to about it with your boys or your girls? That's cool. Do it in private. There used to be this thing called a phone that you didn't text people on. You just talk to people on it. Just get with your crew and just talk or just meet up and y'all can have lunch and chat about it. You don't have to spill your guts on social media all the time. Give people a chance to see it. So yeah, I'd say like a month and then chill. Everybody just calm down. And I'm still pissed I got it spoiled, so I'm bitter. All right. Well, before we uh, end this, I guess, let me just say, Ashanti, I love you 3,000. Anyways, Ed, what's going oh on? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how I miss this place. Um, Soul and Stereo, it's been kind of quiet lately. We haven't gotten too many album releases, but by the time this podcast drops, we should have some new album releases co- popped up which means your boy will be back in review mode. I've got a new edition of Love Letters up, and hopefully by the time this posts, I'll have my ranking of the entire Jodeci discography. I'm not just talking about the four Jodeci albums, the KC and JoJo albums, KC solo album, tons of stuff on soulandstereo.com. That should be up soon. Dope. Um, guys, I think that's it for uh, this week's podcast. Uh, thank you guys for listening in. We had an awesome guest. And uh, we're going to keep this going. Man, so many things to talk about in R&B every week. But we're going to keep this going. So with that said, this is Tom, Ed, and Kyle. And we are out of here. We're out. We're out. We're out. We're out. We're out. We're out. We're out.